Hi, welcome to the All Things LGBTQ interview show, where we interview LGBTQ guests who are making important contributions to our communities. All Things LGBTQ is taped at Orca Media in Montpelier, Vermont, which we recognize as being unceded indigenous land. Thanks for joining us and enjoy the show. On this year's ballot, Vermonters are going to be asked to vote on what has been referred to as Proposition 5, which is an amendment to Vermont's constitution. And as we get closer to the election, I am guessing there will be a lot of discussion and probably more than a little misinformation about what Proposition 5 is and what it will do. So joining us is Charlie from Planned Parenthood. Welcome, Charlie. Thanks for having me. And Indy, who works with the ACLU. Welcome, Indy. Thank you. I, I am so delighted that both of you agreed to participate in this conversation. And where I would like to start is Proposition 5, which the media has been attentive to referring to as the Reproductive Liberty Amendment. Exactly what is it and what will it do? So the Reproductive Liberty Amendment, also called Prop 5 or Proposal 5, is a proposed amendment to the Vermont Constitution that would protect every Vermonter's right to make their own reproductive choices. And so what that means in practice is that it would protect the right to become pregnant and carry a pregnancy to term, as well as choose or refuse contraception, sterilization, and abortion care. And so we have made our way through the legislature with the Reproductive Liberty Amendment. We have qualified for the ballot. And so Vermont voters will have the final say on the Reproductive Liberty Amendment in November. So that seems fairly simple and straightforward, but I also have to ask, isn't that some of what the work was that was done last year creating statutory changes. So mm -hmm. why is a constitutional amendment also needed? And Indy, since you're with the ACLU, I'm going to throw that one to you. Yeah. Um, so this reproductive liberty amendment um, goes a step further than what's uh, currently in the statutes. Um, it is with the um, current state of reproductive liberty uh, in, in the news and just like what's happening federally, um, we've, we want to make this uh, a greater protection by enshrining it in our constitution. And uh, by doing that, it, it means that the government cannot interfere um, without a compelling state interest. Uh, so it just, it makes that uh, the reproductive autonomy um, and those choices more protected um, than what the statutes currently provide. So if in fact the current U.S. Supreme Court does overturn the Road v. Wade precedent, what will the passage of Proposition 5 mean for people here in Vermont? And either one of you can take that one. Um, I can speak a little bit to that and then Indy, fill in any gaps, please. So um, if Roe v. Wade is further hollowed out or overturned by the U.S. Supreme Court, our rights will be protected in Vermont. Um, we, as you said before, have a statute protecting our reproductive rights um, on the books right now. Um, but what the Reproductive Liberty Amendment would really guarantee is that the rights that we have today will be protected tomorrow. Um, we all know and have seen um, political landscapes change on a dime over the last couple of years, and a law can be repealed in one legislative session. Whereas a constitutional amendment, um, as you've 
all heard or perhaps seen with Prop 5. We've been at work since 2019 and still have a ways to go before our constitution is amended. It's a, a near permanent process. And so it will really solidify for the future um, our reproductive rights in Vermont. Indy, do you have more to add to that? I think Charlie did a great job at, uh, at describing that, yeah. Yeah, the ACLU may need to, to steal her away. So, <laughs> so as, as the debate continues, I know that messaging is going to be very important to ensure that people are getting accurate information about what the reproductive liberty amendment will and will not do. What are some of the key components that you're hoping that people are gonna hear? And I'll give this to you, Charlie, because I know that you've been working on this specifically. Yes, um, so I have the privilege of managing the campaign to pass the Reproductive Liberty Amendment. And um, you look at any poll, you will see that people in Vermont truly value reproductive freedom. And so it's strongly supported in every corner of our state. We're not trying to tell Vermonters anything that they don't already know which is that reproductive decisions are central to the course of their lives and that we should all have the freedom to make those for ourselves um, and choose for ourselves whether um, or when to have children. So that's really what we want people in Vermont to know after this campaign's over. So I know that when Vermont during the 80s tried to do a constitutional amendment, which was lovingly referred to as the Equal Rights Amendment, and it would ensure gender equity, that the people who were opposing it went to great lengths to distort what the amendment would or would not potentially do. Are you already starting to see any messaging that is deliberately trying to misrepresent the Reproductive Liberty Amendment? Yes, um, con I would say all the time. Um, there's just constant misinformation about what this um, amendment would do for people. Um, it is just an amendment to protect the right to become pregnant, carry a pregnancy to term, and choose or refuse contraception, sterilization, and abortion care. That's all that it does, um, plain and simple. Yeah. Yes, and you know the the meaning of the reproductive liberty amendment has been, you know, rooted in decades of of case law. You know, it's it's not like we sat and scribbled out something and and legislators move forward with it. These words have real meaning behind them. Um, from, from Roe, from Planned Parenthood v. Casey, from plenty of other cases and the purpose statement from Vermont legislators. And so um, we are going to be working very hard over the next nine months to make sure that Vermont voters know exactly what the amendment does and um, can make their voices heard at the ballot box. Are, are there any specific messages that you've already seen in an effort to distort what this amendment would do that you would like to address now? And then we can talk about when they start showing up in public forums, how, how somebody might respond to them. That's a great question. So um, I, I think the kind of biggest argument that we get about the amendment, which I think is kind of very interesting, um, is that the amendment is radical, that it, it goes far beyond what we have protected today. Um, and the reason why I think that's really interesting and that I'm noting it here is that uh, all the reproductive liberty amendment does is enshrine the protections that we have today 
in our constitution for the future. We are not changing the way that reproductive health care is distributed today. What we're really doing is recognizing that those liberties are important to the people of Vermont today and should be protected for future generations. So if, if I start hearing distortions, I should respond to them immediately and say, no, this merely ensures that despite any change in the political regime, my rights have indeed been protected here in Vermont. And, and y'all are welcome to come join us here. So if somebody wanted to become more actively involved in advocating for the passage of the Reproductive Liberty Amendment, how, how would they go about it or, or to whom should they reach out? Go ahead, Indy. Um, Deliver the call to action. <laughs> yeah, so the best way to get involved is to visit um, reprolibertyvt.org uh, and pledge to vote yes on the Reproductive Liberty Amendment. Okay. So Keeping it, it simple, yep. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I will ask you to, to, to send me that specific site and we'll ensure that it gets posted during our interview. So as, as we're ending our time together, is there anything that either one of you would like to say about you know, the Reproductive Liberty Amendment, the process or anything that we haven't already covered? Um, I would love to just talk about how this intersects with uh, LGBTQ plus issues. Um, so the core of this amendment is that we should all, no matter what our identities are, um, have reproductive freedom protected. Um, and the government should not be able to create or perpetuate systems of inequity. So um, just to note, like that vision hasn't been a reality for LGBTQ plus people, as well as BIPOC and people with disabilities and many others. So this amendment is a really amazing step forward um, in, in addressing some of the inequity um, that those groups have faced. So Charlie, yeah. do you have anything? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think Indy's making a really great point in that, um, you know, as a queer person who is managing this campaign, I think a lot about how the Reproductive Liberty Amendment would impact me and my community. Um, and having control over your reproductive decisions can really affirm your gender identity, your sexual orientation, and it can also do the exact opposite if those decisions are taken away from people. Um, and you know, it's just a really significant impact that reproductive decisions have on people's lives and their bodies um, and how we see our identities reflected back at us. And so I am really, really happy that I got the chance to connect with you, Keith, and, and talk about this because I think this amendment is really critical for, for everyone in Vermont, including LGBTQ plus people. So I can expect that when we get to start the process for another constitutional amendment, this time taking sexual orientation, gender identity, disability status, sex, gender, and also elevating it to the Vermont constitutional level for protection, that I'm gonna to get to come back and interview both of you again. That sounds wonderful. Yes. <laughs> I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> okay, with that, thank you so much for spending this time with the, and I'm looking forward to our next admit, amendment initiative. Thank you. <laughs> Welcome, Oscar Newberger, who's a return guest. Uh, Oscar is a former Youth Edition panelist who has become an adult, I guess, and is kind enough to return to the show to check in with us and tell us what he's been up to. So it's great to see you. 
yeah, it's been, it's good to see you too. You know, I don't really get out much these days because of COVID and everything. Um, so. <laughs> exactly. And you're no longer in Vermont. Uh, yeah. You're, you're living in Rhode Island now. Tell us a little about what you're up to there. Uh, so I'm here in Rhode Island for college. Um, it's a really weird state. Um, Rhode Island, is, like the weather is really bizarre. Um, it's like, there are no mountains, so it's super windy. The ocean is right there, so it's super humid. Um, like, and everybody freaks out when we get like two inches of snow, which I've found very comical. Um, we had, an ex it was like supposed to like get frosty overnight and there was so much salt on the roads. Like it was crunching under the tires to drive. Um, which <laughs> it's just been as a lifelong Vermonter, well, almost lifelong, it's been um, pretty funny to, to see how other people deal with the norm, I suppose, where we're from. Um, so I'm, I'm here for college. Um, I go to the New England Institute of Technology, NEIT. Um, yeah, uh, I'm here getting my associate's degree in, they call it paramedic technology, but um, it's just like paramedic school. Um, so I'll finish uh, in two years, I'll finish. Um, with a, it provided that I pass the national exam and everything, I'll finish with a degree and my national registry um, paramedic uh, certificate. And then a Rhode Island license, probably. I don't know that I'll stay in Rhode Island, but I'll probably end up with one. Yeah, that's my next question. You're already certified as an EMT in Vermont, you said. Yes, yes. So what happens after you finish this, this degree, you're gonna finish at the end of next year? right um the, new the end of 2023 yeah so i guess that's next year yeah um yeah i mean i'm i'm not exactly certain what i want to do um i know so the national registry is this like government organization that like controls everybody in who works in emergency services or emergency medical services um controls and monitors everybody's um certifications and whatnot um and so if you are an emt already and then you become a paramedic um, they just bump you up in the system. Um, and then obviously I would have to reapply for a Vermont license if I wanted to work in Vermont. Um, uh, because the way that it works is um, you get your, your certification and you're, you're, you're registered. So you can, you can work as an EMT anywhere, but you have to like prove that you can work in local regulations um, by applying for a license. And then when you have your local license, then you can actually work in whatever state you're, you're in. It's, it's, it's a really bizarre system. Um, and I think that we should all just, it should all just be integrated at this point, because like, if Albuterol works in Vermont, Albuterol works in Florida, you know? Um, but it's, it's an interesting, it's interesting that we're, we're, we're still not totally integrated, but yeah, so. What made you decide you wanted to be an EMT? Um, that's a really good question. Um, I'm not exactly sure. Um, I really was just like, like I, I wanted to be like in medicine, like I, but I was like, I don't really want to go to school for that long. And I don't really want to be a doctor because that's boring. Um, and I don't really want to be a nurse because that takes a lot of school. Um, so I was like, oh, I'll, I'll go to EMT school. And so I went to uh, the Central Vermont Career Center, which is attached to Spalding High School in Barrie. Um, and I went there for my junior and senior year of high school. Um, <clears throat> my junior year, was um, I was in the EMS program. Um, and so I finished that with my, uh, I finished up that, took the EMT test, passed the, the, the written test and then the practical test, um, got, my registry, got my registry information and stuff. And I was still 17 when that happened. Um, so I got registered when I was 17 um, and you have to be 18 to be an EMT in Vermont. Um, so, but I wasn't too far off. I, it was like June, the year I was gonna turn 18 and my birthday's in October. Um, so it wasn't too much longer. Um, so then over that summer, I didn't get to work. Um, but I then the next year, um, I um, <clears throat> obviously then COVID, you know, happened. Uh, but then my senior year, I was in the cooperative education program over at the Career Center, um, which basically they take you and they place you out in the community in your field. Um, so everybody from the Career Center who was there their junior year is now el it was eligible to apply for co-op. Um, obviously it's an application so they can say, no, you can't come into co-op. Uh, but I applied, I got accepted. I wasn't surprised that I got accepted because it was just sort of like, you need to have good attendance. And I had perfect attendance my junior year. Um, I didn't even, I didn't miss a single day. Um, and then you needed to be in good academic standing. Um, and I was like, 
on their version of the Dean's List both years or both terms. Um, and I was in the National Technical Honor Society. Um, so I wasn't really, I wasn't worried about, about getting in or not. Um, I was just, and I was on, on good terms with the teacher. So I was like, yeah, I think I'm going to get in. Uh, I got in, it was great. Um, and so I went out and then they got, I got placed in the community and I was an EMT intern technically. Um, but through that, I started working with Waterbury EMS, which is obviously Waterbury, Vermont. Um, and I started working with them. Um, and then I, they ended up and were like, are you, you're a real EMT, right? And I was like, yeah, like, because it was a little bit complicated because they thought that I was on as a student, meaning I wasn't an EMT yet. Um, but it was like, no, I am really an EMT. Like I can actually like do stuff. And um, so I worked with Barrytown EMS. Then I worked with Waterbury EMS and Waterbury EMS was like, do you want to just work? Like, do you want to just work here? And I was like, yeah. So <laughs> it was a weird hiring process. Like I didn't actually have to like go through an interview or whatever, because my eight month internship with them was the interview. Um, so I started working with them. Um, and then obviously I were working, were working with them, like doing 911 calls and whatnot. Um, and uh, what? And so I was doing the 911 calls and everything, responding. And then like with all this was happening during COVID, they were like, do you want to go get this extra certification and you can give the COVID vaccine? So I was like, yeah, of course. So they sent me to go and I did this like, it was like, I don't even know, it was like four hours of training or something. It was super easy. Um, and then they were like, okay, you can give shots. And so um, I, then the, I, with Waterbury EMS, they sent me out to really, I went all over the state. Like I did stuff in, uh, I, I think it's called Richford, Vermont, which if you don't know where that is, me either. Um, it's right up by the Canadian border. It's like literally a stone's throw from the community border. Um, and then I was all the way down in Springfield and Brattleboro. And then I was in Brattleboro. Um, like I was going all over um, Vermont to give the COVID vaccine. I was doing home visits for uh, homebound people in Waterbury and not really Waterbury in Lamoille County, really. Um, Lamoille in Washington County. Um, but, um, and I was doing like testing and stuff. And um, so I was doing a lot of that. And I actually, when I'm going to be back home in Vermont for uh, spring break, I'm, I'm working a vaccination shift because um, they, they still have their hooks in me, even though I'm here in Vermont, even though I'm here in Rhode Island, uh, Zach Arvin from Waterbury still has his hooks in me to get me to, <laughs> to work uh, the Vax Clinic. So I was like, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll make some extra money while I'm back from school, why not? So um, if you're certified in Vermont, what led you to get this uh, other degree, this other AA degree with Northeastern Institute of Technology because you want to be nationally certified, which would give you geographical mobility. You could do it everywhere. Yeah, so I'm nationally certified as an EMT and I'm licensed in, in Vermont as an EMT. Um, and I wanted to become a paramedic and I, I knew that from the beginning. Um, like the, my first day at EMT school, my, my end goal was to become a paramedic. Um, I've been an EMT for two, for two years now. Um, so I feel like people, a lot of people have different opinions about how long you should be an EMT before you become a paramedic. Um, I've been an EMT for two years. I will have been an EMT for almost four years when I graduate with my paramedic. Um, so I feel like I have enough experience. Um, I haven't been like so stressed and so like, like I haven't found paramedic school to be um, overwhelmingly challenging. It's obviously challenging because paramedic school is, you know, it's hard, but um, it's been a challenge that I've been able to rise to. So I feel like um, I've had enough experience that it's fine, but um, anyway, I knew that I wanted to become a paramedic from the beginning because paramedics can, you can do a lot more procedures and you get to, you get to do a lot more um, stuff and you're an EMT. Um, a lot of what you're doing is helping out the paramedics. Uh, you can't really give a lot of medications. You can't really use a lot of the equipment. Um, you can really like, you can bandage people and you can like give aspirin um, for stuff like that. But a lot of the time, um, if for something that's more serious, you're going to have to call for for a paramedic anyway to come do stuff. So as a paramedic, you have almost the same scope of practice as a nurse, as a as, a, as like an RN. Um, it's just a, it's just a little, a little bit different, and you're working in a different um, field. Obviously, like pre-hospital medicine and in-hospital medicine are very different. Um, but I wanted to get my paramedic, and I wanted an associate's degree um, because usually paramedic school you can just get a certification. Um, like EMT is just a certification, it's not a degree or anything. Um, but if you get a degree, uh, you, it looks better. <laughs> it looks better on a resume um, and they pay and you can get, make more money as a, as a brand new paramedic. 
Um, and we're sort of shifting. Uh, EMS in general is a very new profession. Um, like it's only really existed since the 70s. Um, EMS, so it's, emergency, what is EMS? Emergency medical services. Um, okay. It's really only existed since like 1970 or so. The, the REM, which is the emergency medical technicians, which is the, the overarching uh, uh, bureaucratic entity that uh, manages everybody. Um, they've only existed since 1970. They just had their 50th anniversary, you know? So um, it's a very new profession and we're sort of shifting towards um, paramedics being less technicians and more clinicians. Um, and so like we're, we're seeing in the works right now, um, bachelor's, bachelor's degree in paramedic sciences. Um, so it's it, um, more and more education is being required, which is making, which, you know, better and better providers being able to provide a higher standard of care. Um, which in my opinion is never a bad thing. It's never a bad thing to, to provide, want to have a higher standard of care. Um, so I'm, and this school was um, the closest to home. Um, like we're provided an associate's degree. Only one paramedic program in Vermont uh, and it is not an associate's degree. Okay, can you just step back and say that a little more slowly? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, that's um, okay. It was the uh, technology. Oh, okay. Yeah, so this school specifically I chose because um, <clears throat> it's, close to home. Um, I'm really close with my with my family and so I didn't want to go like too far away to never be able to really see them. Um, it's really close to home. It's um, uh, uh, the, the, it's uh, there's only one paramedic school uh, paramedic school, paramedic program in Vermont um, and it is that that might not actually be true. Um, there's one that's like taught at a college. Um, there are obviously other ones that are sort of just like taught but um, the, the best one in Vermont, like the highest accredited one is uh, with Vermont Tech, but it's not a, um, an associate's degree. Um, and so, and this one was close, it's highly accredited. Um, they have something like a 90% a, a um, pass rate on the first try for the NREMT, which is much higher than the national average. Um, I don't know what it is at the top of my head, I'm not that, I'm not that good, but um, the national average for like the first time taking the exam um, and passing is, is a lot lower. Um, then like 90%, which is a really good statistic. They have a lot of really um, cool technology and cool opportunities um, with internships and whatnot. Um, and so all that really appealed to me. Um, so I applied at the, I applied during my senior year and they were like, welcome to the program. And I was like, nice. <laughs> well, you mentioned your family and I remember meeting your mother at a trans conference in Burlington a few years ago. Um, and when you came on the show, you you participated, participated in the, um, the self-harm episode and the transgender episode where you appeared with two other trans people. And I loved that episode. Uh, you were very funny. You may not remember, but you made a lot of jokes. Yeah, and sounds about right. The message from all of you was, don't ask a lot of stupid questions, Google it. And so I take, you know, I think that's an important message. Yeah. Um, you're studying a lot in um, Rhode Island. Do you have friends there? It seems like you have a, you had a lot of friends and a strong support system in Vermont. And how, how's, uh, how's Rhode Island for that? Uh, so it's been, it's, it's been a little bit complicated um, because this is a technical institute. It's a, it's a tech school. Um, so they don't really have a lot of the, your standard college experiences. Like there's not a whole lot uh, like socially that goes on. Um, and a lot of people are um, like, th they're, they're coming here because they wanna change careers and they're already like in their thirties or whatever. Um, and so really your best opportunity to meet people is through going to classes. Um, but when I'm going to classes, I'm with all the guys who are in my paramedic program. Um, and a lot of them live in the area um, and they, they commute to the school. Um, there's one guy who's out of state, he lives on campus. Um, so I, I chat with him sometimes, but you know, it's just, it's a little bit, it's a little bit complicated um, because a lot of the friends that I had have, I still am friends with them that I have in Vermont. Um, we sort of met through like channels of like looking for support, being like trans, being queer, whatever, um, looking for channels of support and that's sort of how we met. And so it's a little bit hard for me to like make friends, I guess, in like a, I shook up a conversation with a random individual and then it's whatever. Um, but I don't really feel lonely um, while I'm here. 
Um, you know, it's not 1955 where I have to send a carrier pigeon to chat with people. Um, I can just like randomly, I just can just like text people if I want to. Um, so I'm not like feeling that lonely and I have so much to study. I don't really feel that bored. Um, like I had to cram in um, the entire nervous system into my brain in like two weeks for my anatomy class, um, you know, which the, the nervous system is, um, you could spend a year studying the nervous system, uh, you know, so uh, <clears throat> um, I don't really, I don't really have that many friends here. Um, obviously my roommate and I are on, my roommate and I are on good terms. Um, his name's Garrett, um, he's cool, whatever. Um, I don't really see him that much because he's in, um, he's in the automotive program here. Um, and so he is on um, a different campus. And the IT has uh, three campuses. Uh, they have this one here in East Greenwich. They have one in Warwick, and then they have a third one somewhere else. Um, and so I, and so Garrett goes to the the campus. All of his classes are on the campus um, over in Warwick, which is not too far. But um, so I don't really see him around the building, um, and I really only see him um, at like in the evenings when he comes back. You also mentioned in your bio you spend a lot of time with Krav Maga. Can you tell the audience what that is? Um, I don't know that I would say I spend a lot of my time. I go twice a week. Uh, Krav Maga is just, it's a, a martial art that I just, that I started, that I picked up just to sort of, um, in an effort to, I guess, put down roots here. Um, because uh, I, I, um, I'm still seeing a therapist here. I think mental health care is very important, um, especially for people who work in my line of work. It's very important. So I'm seeing, still meeting with a therapist here, uh, one who's here and he was like, I think it's really important uh, as part of being a well just person is um, putting down roots where you're living, whatever. So I was looking for places to go. Um, so I was like, oh, like uh, do, I'll do like looking into a martial art. I did Taekwondo when I was much younger than I am now. Um, but I remember it, liking it and Krav Maga is the studio is right nearby. Uh, Krav Maga is a martial art. Um, I don't know all the details of it, but a lot of people take it as self-defense um, because a lot of the scenarios that they teach you and a lot of the things that they teach you are like practical and you're able to do them even if you're a lot smaller than the person who's attacking you um and so the 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 program that i'm in they don't really divide us up into weight classes or whatever um so like i'm i'm five foot ten you know i'm not i'm not a small person um and like i was partnered like the last time with and i'm almost 20 years old you know and i was partnered with this girl who's probably i don't know 15 14 15 um you know five foot four or something and I was partnered with her for like a choking exercise and I was like I don't want to like break this poor this poor child like she's like five years younger than me and the instructor came over and she was like Oscar you were being way too nice and I was like if the if a strong breeze blew through here I think this girl would go flying like a kite like I'm worried um but we, we it was fine she was great um she she got me back so it was fine um <laughs> so you go to a studio twice a week for lessons is that how it works yeah yeah oh I thought, um, maybe, I thought maybe it was like a video game or something but no it's hands-on oh yeah it's a um we we go to a we go to a studio it's 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 like if you were learning karate like you would go to a different building to do it um and then there are mats on the floor and you have to wear a a, a dorky little outfit like we have we have we have little outfits that we have to put on um we have belts and everything um the belt system is a lot different for Krav Maga than it is for uh, like karate or whatever, but um, there is a belt system there. You know, we have to wear uh, like these dorky outfits and whatever. Um, and then uh, and we have to be barefoot, which I don't, I don't, I don't like being barefoot. I want to, I want to have either. shoes on. I want to have shoes on, um, but we have to be barefoot on the, on the mat, which in a COVID era, any, anytime bare skin is touching anything, I'm like germs, 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 but um, they spray it down with antiseptic um, basically constantly. Um, so it's it's totally fine. But um, Well, yeah. Oscar, we're getting to the end of the time, believe it or not. I really oh. appreciate your checking in with us. Are there any last words that you have for the audience? Um, I guess just like if you are like, I don't know, like you're, you're 15, you just came out as trans. Life's really hard. Um, that's like the hardest point of your life, basically. Um, but you know, and like that was definitely the hardest part of my life was when I was waiting to start testosterone. I was waiting to get top surgery. Um, and like, you just feel really stuck because high school is the worst. And then you're trans on top of that. Everything sucks. Um, you know, just like without sounding like a cliche, just, you know, hang in there. 
um, see what can happen after high school. Um, because, you know, high school is terrible. And I, I honestly, my honest opinion is that if you enjoyed high school, you're really boring. Um, <laughs> nobody who, nobody who is um, a super interesting person enjoyed high school, uh, you know. Um, so not peaking in high school is always a good thing. Um, and there are so many other opportunities out there than, um, than you ever could imagine living in, you know, a small town in Vermont. Um, and even if you don't leave Vermont, there are so many opportunities and so many people in Vermont that you haven't met. Um, Vermont feels like a feels like and is a small place, but it's much bigger if you actually are going out and exploring the place. Um, I've been on testosterone the better part of four years now, and I had to I had top surgery October of 2020. Um, so I'm at a really great place in my medical transition right now. So I know it's easy for me to say like just hang in there, but you know I've, I I was there I was there uh, less than less than five years ago um, where I was like. I don't know what I will even want to do. Like everything is terrible. Like I just feel terrible all the time. Um, yeah, just just hang in there. There are great people in the world that you can meet, and life is really hard sometimes, but it's it's worth it, I guess. Um, I I I feel like I've been really successful uh, since my last appearance on on this this program. Um, you know, so I'm I'm really enjoying what I'm doing right now, uh, and I I think that it's important to just at least, at least give it to the end of high school, you know, uh, give it, give it a, give it a, give it a go. See, see what, see what you can do once you leave your hometown. Oscar Newberger, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. It was great to see you again, Anne. Thank you. You'll have to come back in and check in again. In a I know I'll have once, once, once we can get off of Zoom or whatever, so this COVID and everything, it's just, everything is a, the things a tech, it's, it's all technology and I still don't know how to use it. It's been two years and I still don't really know how to use Zoom. <laughs> well, we'll prevail. Uh, we'll Take try. Care. Thank you. It doesn't seem possible, but it's been 19 years since I had lunch with a new, fresh, enthusiastic young man who was about to become executive director of one of our established organizations. And now they've decided I've done my time time to let someone else take a position of leadership. So for this very special edition, please welcome back Peter Jacobson, who has been the executive director of Vermont Cares. Welcome, Peter. Hi, thank you so much for having me. I'm excited about this conversation. I love well, I Vermont Cares and I've loved to get to work there. So happy to share what it has brought to my life. All right, so we will just start right with 19 years ago when you went to work for Vermont Cares. What was it that, about Vermont Cares that you said, that's what I want to do? I, so I was raised not in Vermont, but in another rural town. And I was raised with functionally zero education about HIV, and that made me furious. I was uh, functionally told that I would inevitably get HIV by the time I was 30 and that I would die. I knew that wasn't the case. And I worked to educate my classmates through high school, through college. And I knew from a very young age that I wanted to work in HIV advocacy. It felt exciting and dynamic. And I got to volunteer with Vermont Cares before I started as a staff member. And when the first job came open, I absolutely pounced on the opportunity. It was my dream job. So when you first went into Vermont Cares, and, and I heard you reference that people believed that you would have AIDS by the time you're 30 and then you were going to die. When you actually got to Vermont Cares, what was the work? that needed to be done? And what were the messages that needed to go out in response to all of those things that was happening in the public discourse? I was very lucky. I, I started in a role as the prevention director, which means I got to lead the testing programs at Vermont Cares, the sort of nascent uh, syringe service program, um, which at that point was just out of St. Johnsbury and also the education that we did in schools, high schools, colleges, middle schools, workplaces. 
Um, so I got to address the very concern that brought me to this work in the first place, sort of head on and look other queer kids and non-queer kids in the eyes and say, HIV is preventable, communication is the key. Here are the things you need to know about it to help you make an informed decision for your own health. That felt gorgeous to me. And, and did you find a receptive audience to hear those messages? Did, were, were you actually given access to those populations for whom your message could have the greatest impact? Yes, yes. I think um, CARES has always been respected for the education that we give because it is age and content appropriate. So we can tailor messages about body positivity and sort of your own personal boundaries and consent um, to any age group. So I've worked with kids as young as 10 and 11 years old. Um, we have middle schoolers coming into our offices all the time, grabbing bundles of condoms. It brings me so much joy because they're learning and they're experimenting and they're trying things. And we find blown up balloons out of condoms in the parking lot. It's, I love that people are trying to learn about how to have a healthy sex life. That's fulfilling for them. Oh, exactly. And, and re-establishing a sense of you have a say in what is happening in your life. You have control over this. You know, as you had referenced, many of us, our first introduction to HIV and AIDS was the person we cared for who was diagnosed and who was dying. Yeah. The, for the early part of this epidemic, it was essentially gay men and it was friends taking care of friends in a hospice model. But that's not the case anymore. What, yeah. what does the people who were coming to Vermont Cares, what does that geographic look like now? Uh, it is very different. Uh, the medications used now to manage HIV are head and shoulders above what we had in the mid 90s and the early 2000s um, when I started. Um, and I'm very happy to say, and I guess sad to say goodbye to, but I'm happy to say that a lot of the folks who were receiving services at Vermont Cares when I started are still with us, are still healthy and thriving. And yes, we've lost some people to other chronic conditions, um, but not as a function of their HIV proper um, in decades now. And we you know, I'm saying goodbye to people that I've known for 20 years. It's that part is, of course, heartbreaking. But to know that Vermont is a leader in HIV healthcare, to know that people with HIV in our state live long and healthy and beautiful, productive lives, that that's an accomplishment. Good job, Vermont. Yeah. And and I was gonna say, and, and you've done some really impressive work in ensuring that prep and you know all of those treatment modalities are not only accessible but there is insurance and funding so that people can actually have access to them yes and that we educate patients and providers so that you know how to ask about it so that you know if a provider is going to be reticent you know how to navigate a conversation about why your sexual health warrants a conversation about prevention, pre preventative med medicine. That's all important, and we all deserve that. I was going to say, and you know, being able to provide that degree of education so that you have an informed individual going in, yeah. they know what they can and should be asking for. So yes. I'd, I'd like to ask you if you could reflect a little bit about during your tenure at, at Vermont Cares, what's some of the work that you look at and say, if, only, if we had accomplished only that one thing, it would have been worth it for me to be here? I would say the biggest accomplishment of this organization over the 19 years I've been here has been just the explosion of syringe service programs in our state. Um, we 
are so proud as an organization to now have two mobile prevention units um, that can track around the state in the more rural corners of Vermont and just bring HIV testing, sterile syringes, and other overdose prevention materials, fentanyl test strips, equipment that is saving people's lives to communities that have a hard time accessing our main offices in Barrie or Burlington or Rutland or St. Johnsbury. The fact that we can get out there, um, we over the last 18 months, like peak pandemic, we've doubled the number of people that we serve through that program. And we've doubled the number of sterile syringes that we're giving into the community. So it feels like that is a gift of public health um, that no other organization could have accomplished. CARES is unique and weird and quirky and growing and learning all the time. And I love that about this organization. Okay, so turning the question around, what is it that hasn't been completed that you're looking at saying, okay, that still needs to be finished? We have big horizons ahead of us. Um, I think uh, the way that Vermont talks about HIV still needs to change. I think there's still a lot of stigma around substance use, around sex. Um, as we were talking about before this particular part of the conversation, um, sex during the time of COVID has complicated everything. Um, people are still having sex, I'm happy to report. <laughs> but yes, there, there is so much still to do. We're still looking at um, drug legalization. We're still looking at safe consumption sites where people can just safely use uh, around medical professionals. There are so many different um, public health models that other countries that other cities are using um, that we just haven't been able to get across the finish line yet. So we have big ambitions as an organization and I will be cheering from the sideline watching it all happen in the future. So if somebody watching this decides they also want to cheer on the work of Vermont Cares and they're willing to offer some time to help with the work of Vermont Cares, how would they go about doing that? Or what are the things for which you might need, or Vermont Cares might need volunteers? Yes, Vermont Cares, not me personally, uh, <laughs> needs and deserves and is so worthy of more volunteer person power. Um, our board of directors is growing right now. So people with a clear sense of HIV, a clear sense of how to keep people safe from overdose, um, people who are good at networking in community would be a huge asset to our board of directors right now. We're at a turning point, obviously, as leadership is changing. And I think our board is just wonderful and fun to spend time with. So that's a board worth joining for sure. And uh, just volunteering, I don't know, at the front desk of one of our offices or helping us to build um, kits of materials that help prevent overdose or help test for fentanyl in drugs um, could really, if there's a simple projects you can do at home while watching Netflix um, that allow our staff to do more frontline work. So we have ways of helping. We usually save um, condom kit building um, projects for college students because it makes them giggle and that makes me giggle. So we let them have those projects. It, those also all sound like interesting things to spend my time in. and we could watch Orca and Netflix both. Yes, yes, yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. as Peter yeah. steps through the door on March 31st, what comes next for you? I do not have plans moving forward. I am sort of jumping without a net and just trusting the process. And I'm really excited about that because I have been focused so squarely on Vermont Cares and the politics and finances and human resources and IT and COVID precautions. <laughs> um, all of the functions of this organization have been um, my primary focus for the last two decades. 
And I'm just allowing space to just pause um, through the month of April. I'm going to uh, get my raised beds into perfect shape. I'm gonna start some spring peas, another cute edge. Uh, my flower gardens are gonna be abundant and fluffy. That's all I have on the agenda for all of April. I've never seen my calendar look like that. Um, I will have to get a job at some point. So yes, after April, that's what I'm looking toward. So when I go out back and start fitting my perennials, I'll have to see what I can you know, donate to you. Please. So in our remaining time, or is there anything you would like to say or thought that you would like to share? I just want to say the work that I was blessed to do over the last two decades is work that really anybody can do. Vermont Cares is a, a network of team players. We have 200 volunteers who augment the work of about 12 staff members. There are so many ways to get involved in work that is profoundly anti-homophobic, anti-transphobic, anti-racist, that encourages the voices of people who use substances, people who are unhoused. This work is dynamic and intersectional. Um, and I, I can't say enough how much it's been exciting and heartbreaking and heart expanding to do this work. So please figure out ways to get involved, everybody. I promise it will pay dividends um, and the team that I have, that I am handing this organization's sort of programs to, is in great shape. They absolutely know what they're doing. Um, so I'm really excited to see where this work gets to evolve moving forward. It's been just an honor. And with that, you say that anyone could have done this work, but there's only one Peter Jacobson there was only your style and effectiveness in your advocacy role, promoting the work of Vermont Cares and the integrity of the people to whom you have provided services. So thank you and good luck on the journey ahead. Thank you too, I appreciate it. Thank you for joining us. And until next time, remember, resist. <laughs>